Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our February 28th Board of Commissioners meeting. This is the last day of Black History Month, and I want to acknowledge that. And we are just moving along quickly into spring. We've had a great um, day today with the weather. Um, with that, um, in lieu of having an invocation, I will have a moment of silence here today. I ask that we keep a couple of our employees in mind as we have our moment of silence as we lost an employee recently in the sheriff's office and I just learned today that we lost an employee in the firefighter's office and I believe both were off duty. Following the moment of silence, we will have the pledge and the pledge will be brought by the Walker School Cub Scout Pack 700. I wonder where they are. Where are they? Oh, okay, okay. So after I have the moment of silence, those in the pack can approach here and then help lead us, off, lead us in the pledge and you can face the flag that's here. So with that, all of you who are willing and able, please stand for, or excuse me, we'll stand, we'll stand. We'll stand for a moment of silence and that will be followed by the pledge. Yeah. Thank you. Our pack, please feel free to join us up front here in this area, and you can go ahead and um, begin your Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, it's gonna be the three of you. Very good. All right, so we can face the flag here, and then on your go, we'll get started. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Appreciate you leading us through the pledge today. <clears throat> Did I hear one clap? Would we yeah. like to give them <laughs> Takes a lot of courage to come up here in a room full of people, particularly adults and Speak. So thank you to those of Cub Scout Pack 700. With that, our meeting is officially called to order. We are going to kick off today's meeting with certificates of appreciation to members of the tab. And that will be led by Commissioner Burrell. For those of you who are here for that presentation, please join us up front. Good evening, everyone. As the TAB and the um, Accessibility Advisory Board are making their way up here, um, I, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank these volunteers. They do not get paid, and they are very active um, with Carl Van Hagel and Theo Letman of, and Drew Ressler, our DOT director. Um, they put in a lot of hours, a lot of work, and they're a great advisory board for us, especially with the transit things that are coming up soon. And I thought it would be great to recognize them tonight and just let them know how much we appreciate them. So I'm going to call out the names and uh, give everyone a certificate. I'm first going to just read one. Um, thank you, appreciation. Um, Daryl Howell, you're first from the Accessibility Advisory Committee. <laughs> I knew that. I didn't know you were behind me. So, 
The Cobb County Board of Commissioners, thank you for your invaluable support, hard work, and dedication to the Advisory Accessibility Committee. Your efforts and initiatives have resulted in overall improvement of the transit system. We are grateful for the services you have provided for the benefit of the citizens of Cobb County. This the 28th day of February, 2023. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then we have Clintina Mitchell. Thank you. And then these next two are serve on two boards here, um, the Accessibility Advisory Committee and also the Transit Advisory Board. So they are, they're both my appointments, two of my three appointments. Um, Sherry Newton and her pretty dog. Thank you, Sherry. And Thomas Shibley. He's the reason y'all are all here tonight. <laughs> this was his idea. <laughs> it's a great idea. And then we have Shelly Simmons and Swanee Wilson. Shelly or Swanee? Thank you. Oh, and thank you. Now for the Transit Advisory Board, I'm gonna read uh, Lysandra Boykins. Hmm. Well, Sandra. The Cobb County Board of Commissioners, thank you for your invaluable support, hard work, and dedication to the Transit Advisory Board. Your efforts and initiatives have resulted in overall improvement of the transit system. We are grateful for the services you have provided for the benefit of the citizens of Cobb County. This is the 28th day of February, 2023. Thank you. James Darden. Walter Colas, who's the treasurer. Thank you. Kenneth Marlin, the vice chair. Thank you. Ronald Roberts. He's not here. Will you get his to him? Okay. Uh, Mark Riggins. Forrest Sheely. Jeff Souther, secretary. I need to give Jeff his, he's my other appointment. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see, Matt Stigall. <laughs> and then there were two that could not be with us tonight. Allison Bickers, who's the chair of the um, TAB and Neil Fusillo, couldn't be here. So thank you all for all you do, your hard work and dedication. We really appreciate you. God bless. I'm sorry, Bill. I didn't know you were right there. Don't now leave we need just yet. Yeah, we're going to get a picture. Yes. <laughs> Our next presentation will also be brought by Commissioner Burrell. For those of you who are here and part of Boy Scout PAC 2319, please join the commissioner up front. Wow. Okay. Troop 2139 has 11 Eagle Scouts. Now, I know we honor Eagle Scouts a lot at our meetings, but I don't think we've ever had this many from the same troop at one time. So y'all are all to be commended on all of your projects. 
So I'm going to read, um, I'm going to call your name and say what your project was and ask you to say a little bit about it, okay? So they, they, they are from Unity North Church, Troop 2139. And Jeremy Andre, you want to tell us a little bit about your... Uh, so for my Eagle Project, I worked with our charter organization, Unity North Atlanta, to build a fire pit for them in their front parking lot. All right. Thank you. Dylan Woodcock. Okay, and you did staining of benches at Unity. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so one of my uh, former Eagle Scouts from the troop had built benches for uh, the church that we go to that charters us, and my job was to uh, apply wood stain to all the benches to preserve them against sun and rot for the next couple of years. Right. Yeah, thank you. Zane Nair. Oh, you're right behind yeah. me. <laughs> And your project was planters at Mountain View Elementary School. Yes, so for my project, I built four garden beds and I built one composting bin for my elementary school, Mountain View Elementary School. Michael, Michael Carlin, and let's see. You, your project was dog beds at the Atlanta Humane Society. Yeah, so I built 15 PVC dog beds for the Humane Society, which was where I got my dog, and I wanted to give back to them. And you know we have a Cobb County Animal Shelter, too. We, we'll be glad to put you to work over there, too. <laughs> okay, and Aiden McCarvich, he's not here. Okay, his project was an outdoor classroom at Ford Elementary. Nice. Gavin Huey. And your project was the Peace Garden Rejuvenation? Yeah, so I just redid uh, a Peace Garden for our charter at the church because it gotten a little rotten and it just needed updating. Thank you. Kevin Davis, and your project was Nature Trail Fire Pit at Unity North. So I built a fire pit for our charter organization in the back parking lot for the gardeners to enjoy when they finish gardening. Aiden Myhill, he's not here. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Everest Parton. Okay, our 11 got down to eight. <laughs> okay, Aaron Makarovich. Makarovich, he's not here? No, no. <laughs> one, one is here, one isn't. Sorry. And Wyatt Brook, McKeon Brooks. Yay. <laughs> And your pro project was refurbishing landscaping and updated drainage at Unity North. So basically we fixed up the retaining wall along with removing vegetation from the surrounding environment that was unwanted. And Everest Parton, he's not here. Um, Everest. Um, his project was bird, owl, and bat houses at Ebenezer Downs Park in District 3. So thank y'all. Okay, your troop leader will, um, Steve, give those to your dad. <laughs> and we need a picture. Do the parents want to come up? Or the leaders, the troop leaders? You want me in the middle? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here we go, everybody. Three. Two, one, done. Thank you. Thank All you. right. Oh, wait, hold on. We got some more parents. Let's hold. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Eagle. Eagle. Okay, rounding out Scout Day at the Board of Commissioners, we have Commissioner Gambrill here to recognize Leonardo Gonzalez, if you can join us up here as well. And I'm also gonna ask Commissioner Sheffield to join me. Commissioner Sheffield. Good evening. The Cobb County Board of Commissioners would like to present the Certificate of Achievement to Leonardo Gon Gon Gonzalez. I'm sorry. The Cobb County Board of Commissioners congratulates you on achieving the highly recognized and honored rank of Eagle Scout. We applaud your efforts to improve the community through service and volunteerism, such as hosting a color guard ceremony for Lockheed Elementary School. In addition, you constructed of a flagpole at Leon Hall Price Park and provided a public reminder of patriotism for years to come. We wish you the best in your future endeavors and know you will continue to have a tremendous impact in our community. This the 20th day of February, 2023. Uh, so we built, um, I put up a 50-foot uh, flagpole with, at Leonel Hall Price Park and put a modular wall around it, and oh. that was a project. Very good. Congratulations. This is not part of our presentations, but if there's anyone here from property management, I want to commend you for a stellar job of renovating this room. Even looking at the dais today, I'm thinking this is beautiful. Um, you took our, oh yes, please let's give them a round of applause. It looks really great back here, even though you can't see it. They did an excellent job. And thank you, Ross. I believe Ross was our project manager. We're 90% done. 90%? What's We're getting next? There. What's next? Not ah, secret. Okay. I like the panels, too. They look really good, Ross. Great job. I love it. All right. We are now at public comment. Bill, you can help. Yes, thank you, Chairwoman. As the board provides the podium for public comment, it's appropriate to review the related meeting rules. Please state your name and if you're speaking on behalf of an organization. All comments should be addressed through the chair. Public comment is not a dialogue with the board, but an opportunity for speakers to provide their comments to the board. Uh, the comments should not be impertinent, derogatory, offensive, or slanderous. To that end, the board encourages, regardless of the topic, for the audience to be respectful and courteous to the speakers. Everyone attending this meeting should give others the right to both listen and to be heard by treating each other with civility. Uh, statements made during the public comments portion do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the board or the administration of Cobb government. And uh, just for those public speakers, let them know there is a timer on the podium. With that, Ms. Rosman is the first public speaker. Hello, Chairwoman, yes. Commissioners. Uh, my name is Christine Rosman. I live in the city of Marietta, so I am the city girl. Um, I've been coming to these meetings for a couple of years now, and I continue to be baffled on some of the decisions some commissioners make on behalf of Cobb County taxpayers. And I have repeatedly said, okay, whose agenda are you listening to? Because it doesn't appear that you're listening to our agenda because it doesn't seem to reflect that. And then when I started looking at the verbiage of what's coming from uh, Deloitte and Accenture and Chrysalis Lab, I realized, wow, that's where it's coming from. And, you know, we spend tens, well, plenty, millions of dollars on these 
consulting companies every year. And Accenture had a, did their five-year plan. Deloitte tells us how to spend our ARPA money. Um, Chrysalis Labs is, frankly, from what I gather, is telling us how racist we are, um, which is false, and I know it and you know it. A friend sent me something, and it was on Accenture, and it said, Accenture World Economic Forum 2023. And I was like, what? I thought World Economic Forum was like Klaus Schwab and Marxists and global leaders and Bill Gates and depopulation and Green New Deal and electric vehicles and transhumanism and, um, and DEI, of course. And then, um, and then I started digging around, and then I saw that not only does Accenture have a, a presence there, so does Deloitte, so does Chrysalis Labs, or Lab, um, so does United Way, so do a lot of NGO, non-government organizations. And so it's kind of like, they're all in lockstep. They all have the same messaging, the same World Economic Forum messaging, which is kind of weird. And then I thought, well, how did that happen right here in Cobb County? How did, how did that get infiltrated here? And then I realized that there's something, this, um, the Delphi method. And the Delphi method is something that they use, and I guess that they're able to use it you know, whenever they talk to companies and organizations, and it's a, it's a process, it's a method, and it's a, the goal of the Delphi technique is to lead a targeted group of people to a predetermined outcome while giving the illusion of taking public input and under the pretext of being accountable to the public. For the Delphi to work, it is critical that the targeted group be kept away from knowledgeable people who could lead them away from the Delphi's predetermined outcome. So this is starting to kind of make sense of how it permeated in here. And you know, you all took an oath to uphold the Georgia Constitution, the US Constitution, took an oath to your, your constituents not to tout what World Economic Forum and all of the millions of dollars that all these consulting companies, you know, that our taxpayers have paid for, you're supposed to be listening to us. And it doesn't seem to be happening. And uh, at this juncture, I'm thinking, you know, like Cobb County really can't afford these great ideas that they are selling you and trying to sell us. I know all commissioners don't listen to it, but I'm getting really tired of it, and I think, you know, shame on you guys, because you have taken an oath, and if it's not congruent with what we want, shame on you. And shame on us if we don't hold you accountable to doing what's best for us, not what is best for Deloitte and Accenture and Chrysalis Labs and the ARC and making everybody else happy. You need to make us happy. Thank you. Uh, Jan Barton. Hello, I'm Jan Barton. I'm speaking for myself, not a group. I agree with the, um, the upcoming speaker, Leroy Imken, who you'll hear in a few minutes. And now for my presentation. I'll be talking to you about the concerns that I have regarding the fact that we don't want to have a mobility tax or transit tax. Definitely no MARTA, no DEI, which is reverse racism, no more expensive, unnecessary consultants. That money can be better used elsewhere. We do not want a mobility tax that lasts 15 years or more. There, there will be a negative impact on future generations that did not have an opportunity to vote for this cost, particularly it harms low-income people by adding extra sales tax to the cost of their necessary items. The county could afford to buy a car and driver for every person needing transportation, getting them door to door for, the, for less cost than this ridiculous mobility tax. 
It's a bad idea to implement DEI, which stands for diversity, equity, inclusion. Instead, it's the opposite. It really means dividing, excluding, and inciting. South Cobb News has covered the fact that Chair Lisa Cupid holds secret meetings on a regular basis. Recent examples are those with Chrysalis Lab, United Way, and Accenture discovered through open records requests. These meetings excluded Commissioners Burl and Gambrell. This is against the law. Equity is just reverse racism. In the system of equity, all of those considered minorities must be given a step up in all areas. DEI attests strongly that whites are guilty of past and ongoing racism. Whites will be given lower status than minorities. This is racism and against the Civil Rights Act. Who's more racist? Not whites, Americans say. Americans believe blacks are more racist than whites, according to this report, which shows that only 47% of black Americans agreed with the statement, it's OK to be white. I repeat, only 47% of blacks think it's OK to be white. Equity over safety. When it comes to flying airplanes, it's a much better idea to have those with the most experience and skill rather than just trying to fill the people of color and gender quotas. This poll reveals white Americans see an increase in discrimination against other white people and less against other racist groups. The man who filed a lawsuit saying that he was fired for being white and male was awarded a $10 million judgment by the jury. You're going to see more and more such lawsuits. We don't need to have a race to the bottom as we put people who are less qualified in positions on the basis of their skin color or gender rather than their talents, totally against what Dr. Martin Luther, Luther King stated. One of the alleged Secret meetings held by Ms. Cupid and fellow Democrats was with Chrysalis Lab as an adjunct of the United Way, in which they were providing advice on how to advance equity and inclusion in Cobb. They actually had the audacity to say this untruthful statement. Cobb County, like suburban communities across the nation, remains stubbornly segregated and inequitable along racial lines. This is not true. Cobb County and the state of Georgia are not racist. Georgia is number three out of the top 10 states in America with the largest black population. Georgia also ranks ninth in the diversity index. We have no problem with diversity. Cobb County is 29% black versus the rest of the nation at 13%. Cobb County is 61% white versus the rest of the nation at 75%. In conclusion, we are asking you to stop the racist DEI program, don't hire an expensive, unnecessary DEI officer, no more expensive consultants, don't fund such potentially racist programs as those from inaccurate Chrysalis Lab, redo the survey done by the expensive consultant Accenture, who is a member of the World Economic Forum, you'll own nothing and be happy group. Instead, show in the survey where the respondents came from within the county. Each area has their own needs and requirements. You cannot broad brush our entire county with what appear to be preconceived goals for MARTA, transit, and so-called affordable housing everywhere. Thanks for your time. Patrick McGann. Evening. Hi. Good evening. My name is Patrick McGann. I'm. Uh, it's hard to hear. If you would ask the folks to lower it, please. Um, hi. My name is Patrick McGann. I am a trauma surgeon. I actually trained at Grady. I'm sorry. Give me a moment. Pardon me. Can you give me a moment, please? Just hold on for a moment. And is this another moment of silence? Give, just no. For several meetings, we have had complaints, Ms. Rosman, with respect 
to chatter that centers around where you sit in the audience. <clears throat> so I'm quite dismayed that all of a sudden you hear noise and you dis disrespect us up here by blurting out loud. There are several ways you could have handled that other than the manner of which you did. Please find another way next time. You can go ahead, sir. Uh, my name is Patrick McGann. I'm a trauma surgeon. I trained at Grady. I also do critical care. I've worked in the COVID ICUs for the last three years. Um, I'm going to start by saying there's no more COVID in any of the ICUs. There's barely any in the hospital, mostly because we have testing that's too sensitive and will give you a lot of false positives, which has always been the way. But um, this got my attention. We have the county still offering money for a vaccine. <clears throat> the vaccine, I feel like there's so much data on the vaccine that people act like this is something that's controversial. It's actually not. This data from the CDC, there's data from the FDA, there's data from other sources, insurance actuarials have released data that they've done analysis on. We now have the data from Pfizer that volunteers are going through. So I thought maybe we should go through some of that data together. Uh, make sure we're singing from the same choir book. This first slide is a this first slide is a little excerpt that came out of a FOIA request that the FDA was communicating with Pfizer, and they were forced to release this this little nugget here. The potential for serious harm is very clear. It would be criminal to expose infants and young tr children to this extremely risky product. The list of uh, Pfizer pokey side effects going to be a lot of more job opportunities for oncologists, cardiologists, neurologists, rheumatologists, endocrinologists. And these were the side effects that Pfizer knew about in the early days of the release of this, this vaccine. So these are bunch of lemmings going off a cliff. One of them in the back says something feels wrong and he's told to shut up and do as he's told. And it really feels like that's what we're doing right now. <coughs> Trust the science is what they tell you. Trust the science. The science is the data. The science is not a person. Anthony Fauci is not the science. The data that we generate by looking at actual outcomes is what we look at. That's what science is. This is the survival rate for COVID-19. It has always been, the survival rate has always been 99.99%. It still is. There's less of it around now, but it's still 99% survival rate. So we have a tracking system called the VAERS. It's the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. It's run by the CDC and the FDA. This only goes to 2020. It's up over 30,000 deaths now on the VAERS report. Harvard did a study on the VAERS reporting system that said that between 1% and 10% of all vaccine deaths and complications are recorded in the VAERS database. 85% of what's in the VAERS database is reported by doctors and nurses. They could lose their license if they falsify any of these records. They're double checked. When you report a vaccine complication, the CDC calls you back to double check it. So this is a, just a sliver of what's actually happening. This is a, a data set that Dr. Peter McCullough talks about. This, this whole paper, their conclusion was that the vaccines are effective. But what it really showed when you dig down into their own data set is that 50% of the deaths happen within the first 48 hours of receiving the vaccine. This is the data from the UK in 2021. They had already had 1,400 deaths. This is the Euro, this is the European Union database, 48,000 dead. This is the COVID vaccine deaths worldwide. We have 30, this is as, as of February 23, 35,000 deaths, myocarditis, Athlete deaths, the average from 1966 till now, or till 2004 was two a month, now it's 42 a month. This is excess mortality there, the black. 
That's not vaccinated, that's not COVID. That's excess mortality and it's getting worse. This is by a guy that does data analysis. His name is Steve Kirsch. This is 25 to 44 year olds. They have an increase, a seven times, a seven fold increase in, in mortality. For 18 to 44, it's 84% increase in mortality since the rollout of the vaccines. The Medicare data shows that sir, if you I'm have sorry, the vaccine, you're, you're more sorry, likely five, to your, die. Your five minutes is up. The next speaker is Lance Lamberton. I just want to say, I have all that stuff. I'm saying if you want the data, Sarah, I have it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Lance, excuse me, Lance, if you can give me a moment before you speak. Sure. Yeah. I'm very concerned about creep outside of our rules. And when it starts with one blurting out, it just seems to fester into other things. I would just ask that we please stick to our rules of decorum. The gentleman who just spoke, I'm sorry I was distracted when you initially spoke and you have a robust presentation and this is your first time here. But for some others that have been here for a number of times, you know our rules of procedure. For any of our speakers, I ask that you please remain within the five minute time frame. You're gonna see a clock, I believe, is there a clock that's showing there up is, here? Yes. yes. I just ask that you please keep within that time frame. I wanna respect the time that you have so we can pay attention to you and it helps us to focus on you when you keep within the rules that we have for the meeting. Sorry about that, go ahead, Lance. Good evening, uh, my name is Lance Lamberton and I'm here to speak on behalf of the Cobb Taxpayers Association and more specifically on whether the county should pay over half a million dollars to outside consultants to draw up a project list for a 30-year, multi-billion dollar transit tax. First of all, I believe that the county staff has the knowledge, expertise, and talent to draw, draw up a project's list on its own without using expensive outside consultants. Moreover, I am of the belief that much of the funds to be paid to these consultants will be used to not only draw up a list of projects, but also to develop a communication strategy to sell the tax to Cobb County voters, and that purpose, I maintain, is an illegitimate use of taxpayers' money. I mean, what it basically does is tax us for the purpose of convincing us that we should pass another tax. Anyway, that is the main point I wanted to make this evening, but since I have your undivided attention, I'd like to use my time to make some points on why I think the 30-year, multi-billion dollar tax is a really, really bad idea. One of the arguments made for the tax is that the county's population is growing so that the, so that the demand for public transit will grow accordingly. However, a disproportionate amount of the growth will come from seniors who are least likely to use mass transit. Let's say for argument's sake that the new tax will make it possible to have a bus stop within a half mile of every resident in the county. A half mile walk may not be a big deal for some, but for many, even most seniors, that is a real challenge. Based upon my own personal experience, when I first moved to Cobb County in 2001, I used to commute by bicycle whenever feasible by riding the four or five miles to a county bus stop. I would take the bus to a MARTA transfer station and then take my bike to my final destination. Now, thanks to a serious heart condition and severe chronic arthritis, I haven't been able to use my bike for years. Even walking around the block is a real challenge. The point is, as we get older, we become more and more dependent on our own personal vehicles, especially in a suburban county like ours. So to ask a large portion of our population to underwrite a service that may be, never be used, especially when so many seniors are on fixed incomes during these inflationary times, is unfair and unwarranted. Also, a more robust bus transit network will actually make congestion worse and will increase trip times to unacceptable lengths, leading to underutilization. 
The bottom line is that there is a huge gap between how much a 30-year transit tax will cost versus its potential benefits. It also doesn't take into account how transportation technology will in all likelihood make the mass transit option obsolete over such a long stretch of time. In its totality, the need for mass transit simply does not make sense in a suburban environment, and my fear is that the real driver for it is to advance an urbanization agenda for the county, and in so do doing, diminish the quality of life we have come to expect here in Cobb. My bottom line is that if mass transit is so dead gum important to you, then move to a place where it makes sense. That place is not Cobb County. Thank you. John McLean. John McLean, I live in West Cobb. Kelly Gambrell is my, is my commissioner. I went outside on this beautiful afternoon and my, admired the day. I set a chair out in the sun and let my skin soak up some vitamin D. God is so good, isn't he? He really is. I thought to myself, what could make my life more perfect? I know, I'll declare home rule. I will start by ignoring that darn stop sign at the corner. Heck, no one else pays any attention to it. I will go as fast as I want, regardless of the speed limit. I will put chickens in my backyard, despite all those darn regulations. I will stop paying county property tax, state tax, federal income tax. Heck, they all spend taxpayer money like it's water. What, they won't miss my tax payment. But what would the world look like? If every time we saw a rule, a regulation, or a law that we didn't like, we declared home rule, neighbors would ignore neighbors, cities would ignore counties, counties would ignore states, states will ignore the federal government, the entire world right down to your neighborhood will be in chaos. That wouldn't be right. My mother and father taught me to do what is right and obey the, obey the law in every situation. Even if I don't like it, home rule is not for me. You see, it's not about doing whatever you want if you don't like something. It's about doing the right thing and then obeying the law. So then I started thinking about the word decorum. I've heard it used a couple of times tonight. I hear that word a lot in this boardroom. So I suppose those that use that word decorum know what it means. And they must be setting the example of good decorum. I watched, I watched when home rule was declared and it divided the county. Then the sheriff deputies were instructed to forcefully remove two commissioners. I guess that's decorum. When I note the diversity and equity officer who, by definition, promotes priority because of race, is set to be hired, I guess that's decorum. I guess that partnering with the United Way Chrysalis Lab, who promotes decisions and judgments based upon ethnicity alone, is promoting decorum. It sounds like decorum means dividing the people. That's the new definition for me. Finally, allowing speakers to, pe to speak five minutes and not allowing someone to finish their last sentence before calling a deputy to have them removed is decorum. Knowing that the leadership of this board then can and often will respond to those five minutes of, with comments without any rebuttal from the speaker for 10, 20, 30 minutes if they want, however long they want. Yes, I've seen decorum, and it's not pretty. Thank you. Mr. Emkin.
Leroy really Emkin of Lebanese Cobb. <clears throat> Madam Chair, my comments will be in connection with Attorney Rowling's reading of the current Board of Commissioners public comment meeting rules. As reported by Fox News Digital on February 24th of this year, a parental rights group in Forsyth County called the Mama Bears won a federal First Amendment rights lawsuit against the Forsyth County School District after exposing highly sexualized pornographic books that are being made available in Forsyth County school libraries for students. The Mama Bears lawsuit filed in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Georgia is relevant to our Board of Commissioners public commentary meeting rules. In particular, I recently re read an article on the result of the lawsuit followed by Mama Bears for its rules and guidelines that limit the First Amendment free speech rights of public comment speakers at their meetings. After reading the court order, I thought about our Board of Commissioners public comment and other speaker rules and guidelines that also limit our First Amendment rights of free speech in a manner almost identical to the limitations imposed on public speakers by the Forsyth County School District. I am submitting a comment of the court order for the Board of Commissioners record. I've also submitted copies of that court order for the commissioners and attorney Rowling. Included in the court order, Judge Richard Story ordered the following, quote, the court also permanently enjoins the district, its officers, school board members, agents, servants, employees, and all persons in active concert or participation with them who receive actual notice of this injunction from enforcing the respectfulness requirement. You hear that? from enforcing the restriction on personally addressing board members. Board members, I'm addressing each of you. <clears throat> including the superintendent or any restriction on profane, uncivil or abusive remarks contained in the Forsyth County Schools current public policy uh, or, or, any, or any substantially comparable provision in a future such policy in Forsyth County, unquote. That's a court order. It was for, further ordered that this injunction is binding on the district, its Board of Education, their successors, agents, attorneys, and assigns, and all those in active concert of participation with them. And it was further ordered plaintiff's counsel are entitled to costs and fees in amount to be determined by the, this court if the parties are unable to reach agreement. This order was signed by Judge Story on January 31 of this year. Mr. Rowling. Further, as reported by the Forsyth County News on February 23rd of this year, the court determined on Thursday, February 16, that the district would need to pay $107,500 in legal fees for the plaintiff's attorneys. And the Forsyth County Schools recently agreed to pay that amount. We don't want to pay that amount. The court's ruling can and will be cited in any future lawsuits of this kind in regard to public comment speakers' First Amendment free speech rights at any meeting of publicly elected officials. I am sharing this ruling with you with the expectation that you will take this ruling under ser serious consideration and do the following, which is based on Judge Rich's story's ruling. First, you will terminate the reading of and the enforcement of the current and any future Cobb, Cobb County uh, Commission public comment and other speaker policies in regard to the content of and the manner in which public speakers speak at, at uh, Board of Commissioner meetings. Second, you will terminate the enforcement of the current and any future Cobb County Board of Commissioners public comment policies in regard to the respectfulness requirement, the restriction on personally addressing board members, or any restriction on profane, uncivil, abusive, or abusive remarks contained in the Cobb BOC's current public participation policy. That was an order of the court in Forsyth County. The county attorney shall be instructed to end the presenting of a warning to public speakers at any time during what public speakers can say and not say regarding who public speakers can and can't directly address by name or position during the public speaking presentations. In addition to the above, uh, above three requests, we are asking that a new Cobb County policy will allow, well, uh, that was already addressed that after we speak, you have the opportunities to, to uh, respond to that speak without, without us being able to respond to it. I am addressing Kelly, Jerrica. My brain is not working. 
Lisa, Lisa, Joanne, Monique, and Mr. Rowling, I'm addressing you individually. Mr. Epkin, I'm, I'm sorry, using my your first time's amendment up. rights to do that, and I will continue Mr. to Epkin, use my first time, amendment rights. Your time's up. Thank you. Thank you. Does that conclude public comment? Okay, why don't we go ahead and take a five minute recess? Thank you.
Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Our Board of Commissioners meeting is now called back to order. I would ask for those um, that are speaking and standing in the audience to please find your seat and to refrain from speaking loudly. Our Board of Commissioners meeting is called to order. And it clear the room. For the third time, our Board of Commissioners meeting has been called to order. I will ask all of those in the audience to please lower your voices. We will now go into our consent agenda. At the beginning of the meeting, a number of items that are on our consent agenda scrolled on the screen for you to observe. They will scroll at the end of this meeting on the screen. <coughs> With consent agenda items, these are items that the board votes on in bank, meaning we vote on a number of items all at one time. We've had a number of modifications made to the agenda commissioners. including um, the need to add two additional non-agenda items to the consent agenda. The first one is a parks item discussed yesterday in our agenda session. We will need to add these by four-fifths vote, So, and I will do these separately. Commissioners, I move that we add the parks agenda item to the consent agenda to authorize a temporary revocable license agreement with Wade Ford. Second. Is there any um, is there any discussion or questions? Call the question. The motion passes 5-0. Thank you, commissioners. I also ask that we, well, I move that we adopt a resolution regarding House Bill 517 and Senate Bill 188, and these are res respect to land use and zoning conditions. Second. Second. Is there any discussion or any questions? Call the question. That motion passes 5-0. And thank you, Director Gwynn, for sharing that with us and making some brief changes. Yes, Commissioner. OK. So I understand there are statements that Commissioner Burrell uh, and perhaps Commissioner Gamble would like to read before we approve our consent agenda. And we've had a motion and a second, and it is time for discussion. So Thank go you. right ahead. Yeah. For the record, please add to each vote taken. <clears throat> I do not support the home rule challenge of the majority of this board. It is unconstitutional and illegal. I voted against the amended map three times in 2022, January 25th, October 11th, and October 25th. I have a duty to represent my constituents and will not have my vote suppressed as I was duly elected on November 8th, 2022 under the state map House Bill 1154 voted on by the General Assembly in February 2022, signed into law by Governor Kemp on March 2nd, 2022, and certified by the Cobb Board of Elections on November 15th, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Garibald, did you have a statement? Uh, the only statement I have is that my statement is on record as recorded in the minutes, which start on page uh, 127 of today's agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And for those who may need some context, um, those statements are with respect to the county's assertion of home rule, of which we filed map, a map of um, the county districts that are consistent with the maps that were supported with the consensus of our local delegation and that were also voted on with the majority of this board. Okay, with that, um, commissioners, again, we have our consent agenda. And 
I move that we approve our consent agenda as it has been revised and authorize execution of the necessary documents by the appropriate county personnel. Second. Is there any discussion regarding consent? All right, call the question. The motion passes 5-0, thank you. We will now move to the regular agenda portion of this meeting and the first tab belongs to the DA. Good evening, Chairwoman. Good evening, Commissioners. Thank you for allowing me to present today <clears throat> in reference to agenda item number 23 uh, to authorize the creation and the funding for the Cobb Family Advocacy Center. I wanted to show you a quick video in reference to why this is a necessary um, venture for us in Cobb County. Uh, There we go. Increasing at an alarming rate in Cobb County, the district attorney says they've gone up nearly 30% since the pandemic. Channel 2's Cobb County Bureau Chief Michelle Newell is live with one woman's near-death experience and what's being done to tackle this problem. Michelle. Yeah, she nearly lost her life, and the district attorney says he's hoping to make this center fully operational for victims of domestic violence and other crimes. He's hoping they'll get the resources they need in one stop. I have been blessed because... I live. Janet Paulson was barely hanging on to life in 2015. And I just said, like, don't shoot me anymore. I'm dying. Two weeks before that day, Paulson told her husband she wanted a divorce. He told me, if you think you're going to divorce me, I'll kill you. Paulson says police removed 73 firearms from the home after she got a protective order. But six days later, he ambushed me outside the house. She says she was fighting for her life. I heard pop pop, pop, and I felt stinging in my abdomen, so I knew that I had been shot. He shot me in the leg, but I kept going, but then he shot me in my other leg, and I fell over in the middle of my driveway. Paulson's husband shot her six times, then killed himself. I knew that I had been paralyzed. We've had a, a spike in domestic violence since COVID hit. Cobb County District Attorney Flynn Brody says the number of cases that make it to his desk is alarming. Even a 25% increase is very alarming. Brody's team says the Cobb Family Advocacy Center will help victims. If you are being abused or if you're a victim and, and you can't report the crime be, for whatever reasons, this is still a place that you can come to get the help that you need to survive. Then we consider this to be a one-stop shop. Victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, elderly abuse, trafficking, child abuse, and any other type of crime can come and receive services out of one central location. The DA is hoping to open this, hoping to open this place sometime this spring. His team needs additional funding. Now the Cobb County Board of Commissioners, they're supposed to be voting on it in about a week or so. As for Paulson and how her husband was able to get access to a gun to shoot her, we'll have that story for you at 6. We're live from Cobb County. Michelle Newell, Channel 2 Action News. One of the things I wanted to talk about um, before I show this next video is my goal as your district attorney is, is quite simple as stated in our office mission statement is to enhance public safety and community well-being by supporting victims. The Family Advocacy Center's sole purpose is to support victims of crime and I'm hoping this video will, will give you an idea what a Family Advocacy Center does as we look at a video from, from Birmingham. Okay, it looks like we're not going to be able to see the video from Birmingham, so I'll have to tell you in my own words. Basically, a family justice center, and we've named it a family advocacy center because we want it to be focused on victims, even if they're not part of the criminal justice system. 
The goal is to take care of them to make sure that they get the resources that they need in order to move on with their lives. The family justice centers are victim-centered. They're collaborative working models. They're public-private partnerships. Um, and the research that has shown that they work. Today, um, it looks like my slides got mixed up a little here. Let me see if I can get to the slide I want here. Uh, we have several of our partners in place. So anybody who's here in support of the Family Advocacy Center, would you please stand? We have director, former director Randy Kreider there. Um, we have um, Joe from Legal Aid. We have Sally and Pax um, from our community advocates. We have Chief Ben Hoosers here. Of course, we have Rose. We have several members of my staff here. Um, this is an important project. And as you see on the, on the slide here, all of these partners here are part of this uh, project uh, moving forward. Okay, our slides did get mixed up. Why come? Because we're ready. We have the resources, we have the collaboration, we have everything we need to put this in place to protect our victims. If you look at the numbers, there's, an, there's a problem here in Cobb County. Domestic violence clients served in Cobb County from 2018 to 2020, 36,000. I actually called 911 to ask them how many calls they receive on a daily basis, and that number was 49. And only a third of those result in arrest. And why that number is so critical is because most time a domestic violence victim will only call when she feels or he feels that his life is in danger. And it's usually the eighth or ninth time that that person has actually been a victim of domestic violence that they call. 77 Cobb residents have been killed in domestic violence incidences since 2013. We had nine last year, 10 the year before, and we've already had two this year. What a Family Justice Center provides, it provides protection for domestic violence victims, sexual assault victims, child abuse victims, elder and dependent adult abuse, human trafficking, and stalking. It's a one-stop shop for all these victims in order to meet a navigator, a person to sit down with them and go over their problems and get them the resources that they need to get on. The economic cost of, of national economic cost of domestic violence is $460 billion. If you equate that to the residents that we have in Cobb, it's $1 billion in Cobb County, the economic cost of domestic violence. The statewide overview, the average domestic violence per capita is 3,000. So that's almost 24,000 here in Cobb per year. If you look at these numbers here, they talk about the rise in fatalities. And you can see starting in 2020, they were on the rise. In 2019, we only had three. 2020, we had 10. The murder-suicide rate, Lots of times these domestic violence abusers will kill their victim and also kill themselves. That has been on the rise. And the two that we've had this year, that's what the situation was. The state of Cobb County, our density, um, this slide is old. It says 2,026, but it's actually 2,220 uh, per square mile. Our fatalities, 5.4 per capita. That fourth bullet is one that's so important to me is that children were present almost a third of the time. And we already know that the outcome of a child seeing that trauma continues to go down the more they see. They're more likely to not finish school, to start using drugs, to become part of our criminal justice system. And almost every single person that ends up being a rapist or murder, murderer in our county started off in a broken home. Temporary protective orders. They're on the rise here in Cobb County. And Cobb County has a dubious distinction of having the highest number of long-term TPOs in the state. I've talked about the fatalities already. Um, we've talked about this slide already. This is a comparison to our sister counties that are, are in the metro area. And if you see 
see the numbers, you can see that Cobb County is, is much higher than it should be per capita. We're in, we're in a situation where we have so many people that are in danger because of the fact that they have nowhere to go, nowhere to seek the help that they need in order to be able to um, escape their abuser. These are some of the other things that the, the Family Advocacy Center will, will address. People who have been um, victims of sexual batteries, especially our children, aggravated sexual battery, sexual, sexual battery, child molestation, rape, stalking, aggravated stalking, simple assault, family violence, aggravated assault, simple battery. All of these charges will fall within that realm that can visit the Family Advocacy Center and get the help that they need. Some of the questions that I've heard is this is not a one-stop shop. Well, it is because the navigator's sole role is to connect them to the resources they need. They don't necessarily have to be on site, but the navigator has the information, the contacts, and the ability to place them where they need to be to get the help they need. And what it does more than anything, this is what was shown on the video, it allows that victim to tell their story one time and one time only, confidential, and get the help that they need to make sure that they get away from our, their abusers. For our community, the biggest thing that we want to make sure that we do is protect our kids because the more violence they see, the worse things are for them, the worse they do in school, the worse they do in the, um, growing up. Everything goes downhill from that point on. And just to give you a short story, um, my team told me to be short, so I'm gonna be, it's going to be a short story. Two, two people, both of them are high school athletes, 14 years old. One plays defense, one plays offense. The offensive player, his mom is subject to domestic violence to the point where she decides to leave the father. She gets no financial support from that point forward. So the young man decides, I'm gonna help mama out, but instead of doing it the legal way, he decides to start selling drugs. He gets kicked off the football team. Soon, probably not even three months later, he is killed in the process of selling drugs in somebody else's drug territory. The other young man, same situation, father and mother separate. He decides to get a job also, but he gets a job selling watermelons or throwing watermelons and literally gets paid one cent for each watermelon he throws. That young man goes on to grow up to be somebody standing in front of you today because he saw the abuse his mother took he made a determination that that was not going to start or it was going to end with him. When I first came on board in Cobb County, and, and Kim will probably remember this, um, that January there was a domestic violence seminar in, in D.C. And I went to that seminar. I had to go through Kim to get all the paperwork to do it. But I wanted to go through it because I wanted to understand why it happens, why people don't tell about it because I watched my mom go through it to the point where I had to beat my father off of her with a baseball bat when he was trying to sexually assault her. But she never called the police. We've got to give people a place to go so they can get the help and get away from their abusers. That's why I'm asking you to pass our family advocacy funding bill uh, agenda item so that way we can make that happen. Make Cobb County the best place it can be for every single person in the county. So I'm asking you to, to vote for the for our agenda item. Thank you, DA Bobby. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, it takes a lot to be able to share something like that, but it also um, demonstrates your passion behind moving this forward. And I know you sharing that um, will help a lot of people be able to share their story and hopefully help keep some from having a similar experience and knowing the impact that it's had. And hopefully give some hope to some people, to um, young persons who may be in families experiencing that. So thank you. That was impactful. Um, before um, I'm going to ask the commissioners to vote, we've had some robust discussion with respect to this yesterday. Yes. And the discussion wasn't necessarily whether or not we supported this moving forward. I think 
we do support this moving forward. It was the how we were going to fund it in light of the budget that was set and in light of the upcoming budget that we do have here today. So before I make a motion, I would like to hear from finance to um, understand where we are with that. Thank you, Chairwoman. So Thank I know you. we've had a lot of discussions uh, about this, and I believe the, the direction or the consensus was to can move forward with the agenda item, funding operating and capital, um, putting tabling the personnel request until a later date through the budget process. Um, and basically what we do is amend the funding statement to remove the BOC contingency line and the increase to the salary and fringe line. Those would okay. come back through the normal process channels, but allow them to move forward with the capital renovations needed and the operating costs to begin the program. And um, I know we've had lengthy conversations. I've touched base with most of you. So um, I just want to make sure that that my understanding is the will of the board and allow the DA to uh, add some additional comments to that if needed. Thank you. The audience doesn't have the benefit of looking at our agenda page there. So I'm going to try to walk through some figures and where I believe our finance director is saying we have consensus. There is a total ask for 458,300 plus 88,421 dollars. Yes. And I'm not seeing the total of that here. Oh, the total request is for 572,482 dollars, of which we were informed in the agenda item that there is 315,000 of one-time startup costs and the balance of those funds would be recurring dollars. Yes, Chairman, Chairwoman, that's correct. There would be, it's uh, 315,000 of capital renovations. Uh, that would be materials, supplies for 150,000, uh, 130,000 for security equipment and 35,000 for autos. That would be the one-time capital cost of 315. Okay. The remaining amount of the $458,300 is operating, and those would be reoccurring costs as we were to move forward. Okay. And then as you referenced, the, the, the item that I believe that is under discussion to be removed from this item to come back later is the $88,421 of personnel um, adjustments. Thank you for sharing that. So I know when I originally met with um, the DA and with you, Bill, I was in support of us getting the building renovated um, so that we can prepare to open because I knew that that would be a one-time cost that we can use with fund balance. And then we can come back and later consider the positions in the budget cycle because typically you don't use one-time money for recurring costs because you could be something funding something up front that you cannot continue to fund on an ongoing basis because you don't know whether or not the resources are going to be there. And so it made sense to wait to follow up through the budget process for those salary positions. Now, what we learned yesterday, at least what I learned, I don't want to speak for any other commissioner, what I learned yesterday that there is already some staff that is helping to fill the role of the navigator through some creativity in the DA's office. Yes, we, we, okay. we've dedicated two of our victim advocate positions, grant funded positions, to be able to staff those two navigator positions. Okay, and so seeing that this is already moving forward and there's help in the community to do that and you found funding with the resources you have, I shared yesterday that I would be amenable to supporting operating expenses to support those two persons that are already funded and waiting to add any additional staff during the budget cycle so we can ensure that there's funding. So what that would do is that would take the one-time request for, of 315000 up to 458000 and we would just have a remaining 88,000 that we would consider in our ongoing budget. It's a stretch beyond what was considered, but again, I'm trying to meet you where you are and asking you to help meet us where we are because the reality is we've had ongoing requests and impact to the budget and we don't know where the resources are gonna be until we hear from our tax 
um, assessor's office and, and get uh, a sense of the digest. And I'm very concerned based on past decisions that we've made that have also seemed exigent to the county, like funding, public safety. Um, so I'm understanding the consensus of the board is to fund the 458. And I just want to make sure that I'm seeing some nods, but I just want to make sure that that's the case. So I'm not speaking on anybody's behalf, but that is what I'm willing to help support today. So it would be the 315 for the funding to get the building up to where it needs to be. Yes, ma'am. And the one-time startup costs and then the operating to support the, uh, the staff that you have in place. Yes, ma'am. That would, that would help us tremendously. Um, one of the things that we have already started getting calls in reference to needing help um, after we did the building dedication. So the need is, is obvious. And so anything that can help us get started will, will, will get us going forward. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna start with Commissioner Gamble and ask where you are with this. Um, DA Brody, this grant for this Family Advocacy Center was actually received in 2019, correct? 2020. Okay, we applied for it though in 2019. Um, my issue with the broadcast that you've shown, again, gives the impression that as soon as we give you these funds, you are gonna open this door and all these services are going to be available. Yet part of the robust discussion that you mentioned that happened yesterday, that's not going to be the case. So my concern is that news article is kind of giving a false impression of expectations of the center first opening? I, I think um, your, your perception is wrong. Um, we have to remember that everybody does not have to be housed in the building in order to provide services. The goal is to have one place for everybody to come, to speak to someone who has the knowledge and the resource, the, the resource contacts to get them the help that they need. It was never designed for everybody to be in one place. We have too many resources for that. Our core partners will be there, but not everyone that is going to be able to provide services for the Family Advocacy Center will be in that spot. Right, and I know that was also kind of discussion yesterday because several of the commissioners remembered that it was originally promoted to us that it was gonna be, as you say, a one-stop shop, which means all the services were gonna be there. But from there, you know, we've been working on this and where I struggle, it's not with the program and what your intent is, is the fact that we've known about this since 2020. We knew the timeline that you needed to have to open this, yet it wasn't funded in the budget. Where my bigger problem is, is we've had other departments, such as the probate court, come up and ask for a similar request because of trying to fulfill a need in the community. I'm struggling saying that your need is more important than her need, while yours is more of an emotional one. Again, people going through probate court, that is a very emotional time for them too. So I am struggling how the board is, you know, again, um, balancing policy here and meeting the needs of all departments and treating them all fairly. Um, Uh, that's all I'm going to have to say. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner Richardson? Yeah, I think most of my questions were answered. Um, and I know you touched on the one-stop shop discussion that we certainly had at length. So if anyone's interested in watching that discourse, it is recorded. Um, but, oh, well, no, it was just a public meeting. Just public meeting. Fair. Well, that's a little hint of what the conversation entailed was what the definition of one-stop shop was, how accessible, what was the experience from the end user who needed help, and what would that look like upon arrival with the site navigators. And we discussed what a pilot form would look like, what a long-term form would look like, and what it sounds like is that at the long term, it's not every resource available in the community, it's their core services that will be available and then there's accessibility and knowledge associated with the external services that can be brought in for that individual, but that they would only have to go through that, that one time as opposed to multiple times in today's, um, today's setting. 
So that, that was clear to me. I'm seeing nodding as though that's a check that my understanding on that is, is accurate. That, that, is, that is accurate. Yes. Okay. And then to certainly the question about, you know, in, in discussing the 88K versus the 458K, that's really where it comes down to the, the, the balancing of what other similar areas are requesting. And that is why I know personally I have hesitation with doing anything around personnel because that was, that's, that's very specific within policy for how we approach our budget and the budget cycles. That being said, the other components are appropriate for the fund balance definition that is consistent. And that was also what was consistent with the other courts and, and other um, constitutional officers that have asked for certain things as well. So in that light, um, I certainly do support the initiative um, but I do support removing the 88 for now into the budget cycle and then um, taking care of the 458 today as a part of those one-time expenses. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Commissioner Burrow. Thank you. Um, this, this idea and the ball started rolling initially with the previous DA and um, it was really a need that we saw um, in the community. And I know that um, when you came on board, you know, it more we were um, offered to visit other states and counties that have this similar situation. Um, I think the notion of everyone housed in one building is not the notion I have because the partners that you're going to be that are going to be partnering with you, um, the different nonprofits, legal aid, live safe, they have their own operation, Safe Path. But it was my understanding that they would be um, a representative from those organizations <coughs> that could help the victims that come to the Family Advocacy Center. And then yesterday in the discussion, um, the, the, the navigator position will connect them with the representatives for the, whatever their needs are, abuse or whatever, and um, representative from the organization will come to the Family Justice Center to meet with the victim. Is that correct? That is somewhat correct. Um, they will always have, a, they will have a space in the center if, if they want to how, to sit there, um, they can, um, but it also offers them an opportunity to get the call, then to come to the center to take care of the need. To be on call, right. But the, the resources are there, just not all at one time in a, sitting in an office waiting. But the, the navigators will do the the connecting and the phone calling and direction of where they're to go. Exactly. To come to them. So, um, and I know we discussed this one-on-one -on -one as well, and I do feel, I do, I, I don't support new positions in the middle of this budget cycle. So, um, it's good that you can move the two grant positions to start up with the two navigators and then the additional personnel you will come back and ask for in next year's budget. Yes, ma'am. So, um, so I'm, I'm just, with your, the figures y'all are throwing out, the 315 is one time for capital for yes, the building and equipment to be up to speed? Yes. Um, and then, the operating cost is the balance to the 458-300? Correct, ma'am. Okay. Um, and that's just to the end of this fiscal year? That's correct. Okay. So Thank September 30th. And then you will come back and ask for everything um, that's continual and new positions in um, for October 1 fiscal year next yes, year. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Shepard. Um, 
DA Brody, um, with the conversation with respect to having the nonprofits at the location, it was also shared at the work session that at some point, and it might be a longer term goal to have someone there um, on a more permanent basis rather than having uh, the navigator to go out and bring the resources back. Is that your plan to have like um, the nonprofits on a more permanent basis there? That is the ultimate goal, to put as many partners in the building as we can so that way services will be ready and available immediately. Um, that, that's the goal. Um, most um, family advocacy centers or family justice centers start off small, start off slow, um, and as people feel the need and, and, and know that this place is going to be there and, and be a, a resource to them, um, those nonprofits will see that the opportunity to, to serve people will be there more than it is at their normal location. Because I'll be honest, before I became DA, a lot of the resources that we have, I didn't know about. Right. Okay. And, and I'm, if I didn't know about them, and, and I'm in the legal community, I can imagine our normal citizens don't know about them. Okay. And for our residents and some that may be watching that are, that are just learning about this for the first time, can you just walk us through quickly a typical scenario? A typical scenario, and, and this, is, this is one that's outside the criminal justice system. A young lady's being abused, um, and she has nowhere to go. He's the one who controls the keys to the car. He controls the rent. He buys the food. He, she solely depends on him for her and her children. She's being abused. She's being hit. The children are seeing this. She has to find somewhere to go, otherwise he's going to eventually end up killing her. He's already choked her. And signs say when, when a man chokes you, he will kill you eventually if you stay long enough. So she has to find somewhere to go. She's not, she has no family here. She has no other resources. She comes to the Family Advocacy Center. She talks to the navigator. She says, I need a place to stay. I need daycare for my kids. I need a job. I need food. The navigator gets all those resources and connects her with them. They get her a place to stay. They get her daycare so she can find a job and start employment so she can take care of herself. So she doesn't have to go back to that abuser. Every time we do that, we're going to save a life. And when women know, when, when, when those victims know they have some place to go, they don't have to wait anymore. They don't have to wait till that man decides he's finally going to kill them. Because as a domestic violence prosecutor, the thing I hated most was every time I talked to someone, the first thing they said is, I don't want to press charges. And I would ask them, how many times has he hit you? How many times? And I, I promise you, it was always seven or eight before they even called the police. And sometimes it was the first time that they felt that they were actually going to be killed. And that's what we want to stop. Mm -hmm. Because the patterns are there, the science is there. When a man or a woman does certain things, they have to get out. And they gotta have somewhere to go. They gotta have something to do. Right. You know, when, 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 I, when I read a report of a man committing suicide after killing his wife, or the story for Janet Paulson, when she says, I'm going to leave this marriage because I'm tired of the abuse, and he refuses to let her leave without trying to kill her. We have to do something in our community to make sure that the people that we are sworn to protect, that we protect them. And I appreciate that. And I know that this has been a labor of love for you. And you came before the board, I believe, either, I think it was last year, and first intro introduced this idea to us. And you've traveled to different states. So we really appreciate your efforts here. And it's definitely needed in a community. And thank you for sharing your story earlier, because it takes a lot of courage to do that, and you and I have talked about this yeah. issue and how we were both personally impacted by this type of uh, abuse. So thank you for that. Um, I didn't, you didn't mention earlier that you do have funding for one of the positions, but that's not the position that's in front of us for consideration. Current, currently so. we have funding through September 2024 uh, for the director position that Tanisha currently holds. Um, and we're going to use two of our uh, VOCA grant positions to, for our navigator positions. Okay, good, okay. Um, 
Okay, good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, I'm hearing support for the 458. And um, DA Brody, I'm glad to hear that there is a desire and a possibility. I'm hoping a likelihood of ramping up where there's more physical presence of our partners because I have to share that Commissioner Gamble's assessment of what she perceived was my assessment as people were telling me about the sites. So I'm hoping that um, the resources we put into this will bring more people and um, be a viable space for our partners to be housed or at least have a representative of their organizations be, um, be present when someone comes into the facility. Yes. And, and Chairwoman, um, just to give you another note, we, we have sought funding in other avenues, um, okay. especially with our, our Congress in, in, um, in Washington, um, and they've given us a blueprint to seek to, to get out get of that funding. Okay. Um, we applied last year, we didn't get it. Um, I went up to Washington, I went to Senator Dawson's office, talked to him, he gave us the blueprint to, to how to do it. Um, one of the things that he asked is that he wants everyone on our leadership team to support this initiative. And that will go a long way towards us getting money from, from Washington. And, and so that's one of the things I'm here to ask, is that we get everybody to support so that way we can go strong when we go to Washington to yes. ask them for this money. Well, I'm certainly hoping that the senator, in reflection of the body of which he serves, understands not every thing that moves forward moves forward with 100% of a vote. Yes. But certainly it takes um, a majority of a body to move um, initiatives forward. I'm hoping that you have a majority here today and that he will still see the partnership of this board. I was sharing with commissioners as you were presenting your item that our seal was also present as a partner. And we have a facility that's being utilized for this. So we've invested in providing that space and now we're investing in um, renovating that space. And again, the operating camp, um, operating um, capital for um, those who will be there. So I'm, I'm pretty hopeful about our leadership here and I feel good about our investment and um, likely support Thank you. Um, during the budget cycle. So with that, commissioners, I move that we approve agenda item number 23 with the revision of removing the BOC contingency to total $458,300. Um, is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 4-1 with Commissioner Gamble in opposition. Thank you. Thank you, board. We are now moving on to the transportation tab of our agenda. Hi, Drew. Good evening, Chairwoman, Commissioners, County Manager, Drew Ressler, DOT. Uh, my staff tells me that I am down to two breaths per agenda item. Um, <laughs> two breaths. Uh, given, given some of the discussion yesterday at agenda work session, I did want to take a little extra time to uh, discuss and flesh out items Please. 24, 25, and 26. Thank you. Uh, so uh, on um, items 24, 25, and 26. Drew, just hold on a oh, moment. Um, Let's have some people clear out so we can of course. Um, lessen the noise in here. Go ahead. Of course, thank you. Uh, items 24, 25, and 26 are intended to provide planning services for development of a mobility referendum project list. On November 17, 2022, the Board of Commissioners authorized staff to proceed with development of a project list for a 2024 mobility spost ballot referendum for November of 2024. In order to prepare for a ballot referendum, uh, the department recommends contracting for transportation and transit planning services to provide activities necessary for development of the required project list. Some of the services uh, that, that would be required uh, that uh, primarily it's a question of capacity and capability. Primarily it is a challenge of capacity, just time to be able to do these activities. In some cases it is capacity 
or excuse me, a capability. Uh, some of those services that we are requesting support for are uh, transit supportive projects, identifying what is eligible in, in the, uh, the various legislations, uh, cost estimate validation for projects, identified projects and new projects to come about, uh, public engagement, transit network, both the on-demand fixed route and paratransit system recommendations to come out of that project list, financial modeling implementation plan, uh, the timing being so important when we consider a uh, fare box recovery in the financial modeling piece of this, uh, high capacity network refinement, rider ridership modeling, and federal competit competitiveness evaluation, which is important to understand uh, what percentage of the projects are eligible for uh, federal grant funds. Uh, so with that, the department did reach out to three different consultants in order to identify the best of the best from each of those consultants to provide us those services. And for the first one, the department recommends the Board of Commissioners approve project number TR523, task order number one, to the 2022 master task order contract with WSP USA Incorporated in an amount not to exceed $207,205 for planning services related to the development of a project list for a 2024 mobility spots ballot referendum for November 2024. Authorize the chairwoman to execute the necessary documents. Okay, so move. Second. Is there any discussion? One question. Sure. Go ahead. So it was noted earlier that uh, there was concern that these funds would be used towards marketing this particular a, a tax referendum. Is are these funds going towards any kind of marketing activities? Thank you for the question. They are not. Uh, these funds are only to be used for uh, gathering public input in order to be able to identify uh, the, the types of projects and specific projects that the public would like to see in a, a ballot referendum would not be used for advocacy e efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gamble, and then I'll come to you, Borough. Drew, I thought we've had several outreach um, meetings and public engagement, and they've already given suggestions as far as what they would like to see as far as projects. So why are we going to do that again? They have. This uh, allows for not just uh, overall public engagement, because you're right, uh, going with a blanket, just like we did for the comprehensive transportation plan. Um, but what this allows is more targeted outreach to, uh, to areas like, uh, like cities, uh, CIDs, to understand uh, what types of projects they would like to see, helping the cities to reach out deeper into their, into their public and their residents to understand the types of projects that they would like to see. Uh, and so that's uh, some of what we've discussed is uh, to what level we use the CTP as a foundation to demonstrate these are the types of projects uh, that have come out of previous planning efforts, which of these projects would the public like to see continue to move forward? So it's standing on top of the involvement that we've already received to further refine that project list. So I have a follow-up question based on what you just stated, but the cities have already made it known that they supported a five-year transit tax, not a 30. So Again, I'm, I'm conflicted here because we've had support from the cities for the five year, not the 30, but we're moving forward with the 30. So we're not moving forward with support of all six cities. Uh, well, a point of clarification, the, uh, the, the board authorization to move forward with a project list did not specify a timeline. Uh, and so what, what we have recommended when it comes to the question of duration is a short-term plan and a long-term vision. So understanding and, and what we're hoping that these consultants can help us with is identifying those short-term work plans uh, that are really important, that have high impact, have high value in terms of what those projects would provide to the public, but also identifying what the long-term vision is. Ultimately, that will be a question for the policymakers, uh, for you all to decide what to put before the voters and uh, the, the different legislation requires various uh, IGAs with, with cities, but nevertheless, it will be a decision for, for you all, uh, for the cities on what to put before the voters. Our task is to provide a, a robust project list that again provides a short-term work plan and a long-term vision for the board to, to move forward on. Okay, um, before I come back to you, Commissioner, I had Commissioner Brawl, then I'll come back to you, Commissioner. Go ahead. Commissioner Gamble, did you have a follow-up question? Okay, go ahead. Drew, you and your staff have done an excellent job with this board for the last three years, two, three years. Um, at our retreat, I guess in 2021, the 
five of the six cities were for the five year. And I think the consensus on the board was looking at that with the cities. Um, but then this past year, the majority of the board was for the 30 year. Um, and I, I, all along I've said I cannot support a 30 year tax. So you've done a great job, but getting um, everybody on the same page up here is a difficult task for you. Um, and I know you've been through every scenario and um, option that we could do, but I, I would, if we're going to do something, I would rather do the five year for um, transportation rather than um, a 30 year tax. I can't support. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Richardson. Thank you. And I believe you shared with us yesterday that part of the review on this would be taking in the full list of what all of our municipalities and all of and from outreach, understanding what the community wants to do, but compiling all of that and then understanding what of that list falls under 930 and then looking at what the excess is and that that delta that presentation would come back to this board so that we could have that full view and then make further determinations on what to put before the board before the voters that's correct and i'll provide uh, just as an example we we sat down with uh, smyrna and they talked about one of their challenges and i think it's a challenge throughout the entirety of the county is east-west connectivity so much has been done for north south when we look at the express lanes and things like that but east-west connectivity is is a primary challenge in, in west cobb east cobb south cobb and uh, one of the projects that they brought up was uh, Atlanta, Cumberland, and East West Connector. That, that intersection is, is a major challenge. And the question they asked is, would, would that be eligible for this program of funding? And when we look at the full picture of transportation, the full picture of the recommendations that came out of the Comprehensive Transportation Plan, there were high capacity transit connections that were identified uh, to come along East West Connectivity, East West Connector towards Cumberland and 285, and the Express Lane Transit project there, as well as down at Atlanta Road. Uh, with that nexus there, uh, we do believe that doing something like a, a, a major intersection improvement up to and including a grade separation at that intersection would be something that is eligible in order to improve transit operations uh, that, that were recommended in the CTP. It would also improve uh, mobility throughout. So it's those types of evaluations that are a little bit more straightforward in that case, not always quite as straightforward, that we're trying to flesh out both with the public and the cities rather than an either or analysis of uh, either transit and transit alone or, or tr transportation and transportation alone, um, looking at the full picture of mobility, understanding what those desires needs are throughout the entire county and identifying where there's nexus and where there's opportunity to bring that before the, the board as, as a project to be, to be put before the voters. Yes, go ahead. Thank you for that. And it was my understanding as well that part of the reason there was more lean into the MSPLOS is because it provided more flexibility in the determination of that with regards to OPEX, CAPEX, that front, that front end investment versus what it costs to maintain some of those investments, whereas the 170 doesn't necessarily provide the same type of flexibility. It's, it wasn't a full determination that that was being put before the voters, but it was a lean in because it offered that flexibility. That, in terms of what it provides, um, it, you're correct. A, uh, the, the 170 program, which is up to five years, it provides for only, uh, only capital 930, does allow for the operating expenses to come in. And the, the idea behind that is uh, transit does have a heavy operational piece to that. So it allows for that long-term uh, sustainable funding source to be competitive for federal grants so that we can bring in federal funds to, uh, on, on the capital side. Of, of these projects. Um, and the other thing that, that I'll mention with that, again, that these, are, these are up to numbers. Uh, of course, it is uh, for the board to decide ultimately what duration is put before, before the voters. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Sheffield, did you have anything? Okay. Thanks, Drew. Um, last year, November 17th, the board voted to authorize staff to proceed with development of a project list for the 2024 
mobility special purpose local option sales tax ballot referendum for November. My recollection is that we all supported it at that time. My recollection is that the full board voted in support of that. Um, since then, I've met with um, a number of our mayors, say for Kennesaw, and I believe you met with all of the mayors. I have. And I can share with the board, and I would much rather have the mayor share with commissioners directly, that there is support to flesh out how this can work for all of us. And some of them are starting to um, work through what projects could look like in their cities um, with our DOT director, with the thought similar to what you share, Commissioner Richardson, there may be some projects that are road oriented or beyond mobility that could be enhanced through this. And I'm hoping that we'll, we'll see the full breadth of those projects once we have all of the consultants provide their feedback. But I've, I looked at November as being a reset for us to show our support for this work that we're voting on today. We've already voted on whether or not we want to support you to um, move forward with the consultant assessment, and now we are identifying the consultants to move forward with that work. Um, and so I would ask the board for their continuing support. Um, we did learn at our current retreat the interest of our businesses to see us do something with this respect and their general concern that we may not be on the same page. I think our support here tonight shows that we are in support of some of the challenges that they have with getting people to work um, because of um, limited um, transportation options. I think that we have opportunity to not just consider our present. I like what you said, long-term vision, but I don't know if I just like short-term planning because if we're gonna ask people to invest for a significant period of time, it should be more than just a thought about what the future could entail. Um, but um, I think we have significant opportunity to invest in our future and at least just to ask the citizens the questions, to flesh out with the mayors what the options are. This isn't a done deal yet, but hopefully we'll get the data to support where we could potentially go with additional um, help in fleshing out what the lists are. And, and you and look like you want to say something. I did, just ahead. very, very briefly, and, and just to clarify a little bit more about that short-term, that short-term work plan, um, the, uh, the, one of the concerns that we've heard is it's gonna take, it's gonna take 30 years to build all this. Well, that, that's, that's not the case. It's certainly not the case that, that we would look for uh, quick wins. And, and that's what okay. we've heard from a number of the mayors is that they would like to see projects. You know, how, how can we um, look at de delivering projects? What projects can be delivered very quickly? Because generally, and it's not the case across, it's a, it's a fairly um, uh, in-depth financial model. Um, but in a lot of cases, you're, you're building it in the, in the shorter term and then operating it in the longer term. So that's what I mean is what, what can be built in that five, 10, 15 year window and, and what that looks like in, in near terms, as well as what, how that gets us towards okay. the, the ultimate vision. Thank you. Commissioners, are there any other comments or questions for Drew? With that, I'll call the question. The motion carries 3-2 with Commissioners Burrell and Gambrell in opposition. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next item is to recommend the Board of Commissioners approve project number TR-523 task order number one to the 2022 master task order contract with Kimley Horner and Associates Incorporated in an amount not to exceed $192,795 for planning services related to the development of a project list for a 2024 mobility spots ballot referendum for November of 2024 and authorize the chairwoman to execute the necessary documents. So moved as presented. Second. Is there any discussion or any questions? All right, call the question. The motion carries 3-2 with Commissioners Burrell and Gambrell in opposition. Thank you. And our next item is to recommend the Board of Commissioners approve project number TR-523 task order number two to the 2022 master task order contract with CDM Smith Incorporated in an amount not to exceed $129,839 for planning services related to the development of a project list for a 2024 mobility spots ballot referendum for November of 2024. Authorizes corresponding budget transactions and further authorize the chairwoman to execute the necessary documents. Thank you. 
Yes, before I make a motion, I just want to acknowledge that the agenda item that you read just now is different than the agenda item on the board here. Yeah. Um, we will follow the agenda item that Drew read, however, and I'll make a motion that we will approve the agenda item as it has been presented. Uh -oh. 25. 26. 26. Is there a second on the motion? Second. Is there any discussion? Call the question. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm on the wrong one. Can I recall? Sure. Of course. Um, Are we on 25? Can someone reset? Um, yes. I did double can check reset the. Uh, but did we skip 25? Because that was the third consultant. No, no 26 was the third consultant with CDM Smith. Okay, sorry. Can you and, clear and my vote? Mr. Rowland, can I, because we haven't moved on to the next one, can I change my vote? Looks like it's been All right, I'll go okay. ahead and call the I'm question sorry. again. All right, by a sh okay, now it's working. Okay, thank you. The motion carries 3-2 with Commissioners Gambrell and Burl in opposition. Okay. Our next item, I think, is to recommend the Board of Commissioners approve project number B27. Don't look at the number, just read. Sure, this is, this is item number 27, uh, which is to recommend the Board of Commissioners approve project number B2732, task order number one, to the 2022 Master Task Order contract with RSNH Incorporated in an amount not to exceed $383,049 for engineering design of Pete Shaw Road sidewalk, authorize a corresponding budget transaction, and further authorize the chairwoman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Burrell. A long time coming. Thank you, Drew. Motion Absolutely. to approve. Second. Is there any discussion? Call the question. The motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Our next item is recommend the Board of Commissioners ratify a previous action by the County Manager authorizing emergency drainage repairs on Fair Green Drive in response to a sinkhole and voids. Approve project number B2278 to the 2021 countywide unit price contract with Chatfield Contracting Incorporated in an amount not to exceed $198,104.75 for said repairs, authorize the corresponding budget transactions, and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Richardson. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Call the question. The motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Our next item is to recommend the Board of Commissioners approve a contract with Acceler Construction LLC in an amount not to exceed $97,100 for drainage system repairs on Owl Creek Drive, project number B2273, authorize a corresponding budget transaction, and further authorize the chairwoman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Gambrell. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Call the question. The motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Our next item is to recommend the Board of Commissioners approve change order number one final to the contract with Glosson Enterprises LLC, a savings to the project in the amount of $147,612.11 for safety and operational improvements on Campus Leap Road at Big Shaney Road, project number X2303, authorized corresponding budget transactions, and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Burrell. Motion to approve. Second. Is there any discussion? Call the question. The motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Our next item is to recommend the Board of Commissioners approve change order number one final to the contract with DNH Construction Company Incorporated, a savings to the project in the amount of $1,216.56 for drainage system repairs on Gramercy Drive, project number B2241, authorize a corresponding budget transaction, and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Richardson. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Call the question. The motion carries 5-0. Thank you. And our final item tonight is to recommend the Board of Commissioners approve change order number one final to the contract with DNH Construction Company Incorporated, a savings to the project in the amount of $65,308.97 for drainage system repairs on Shallow Ridge Road. Project number B2239, authorize corresponding budget transactions and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Burrell. Motion to approve. 
second. Is there any discussion? Call the question. The motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Drew. Thank you. Now moving on to support services. Good evening, Chairwoman, Commissioners, and County Manager Kimberly, Kimberly Limley, Information Services. Our item this evening is to request the Board of Commissioners authorize the purchasing director to purchase wireless network equipment and deployment services under provisions of State of Georgia Department of Administrative Services contract in an amount not to exceed $1,540,091.97 authorized wiring and installation services from MC Dean Incorporated under provisions of State of Georgia Department of Administrative Services contract in an amount not to exceed $20,972.50, SPLOS projects B0010 and B0020, and authorize the corresponding budget transactions. All right, so moved. Second. Any discussion? Call the question. The motion carries 5-0. Thank, Thank you. you. We are now at our second public comment. The first speaker is Kevin Redman. Good evening, Kevin Redman, uh, East Cobb citizen. <laughs> the state legislature is in the middle of its second year of direct interference of Cobb County's operations. Led by freshman State Senator Ed Tetzler, they are delving back into hyper-local operations after not being satisfied with the results of the 2020 election that brought Commissioner Richardson into leadership over District 2. After narrowly winning his own seat that year, Ed Setzer began to heavily influence, in the shadows, the push for many of the cityhood attempts, ramping up strategy in 2021, and executing a hurried attempt in 2022. These cityhood referendums were specifically built to create, as Ed Setzer would put it, areas of common interests, or as better described, cloistered communities that match his view of what Cobb County should look like. Ironically, all under the guise of local control. In May 2022, the cityhood attempts failed. The cityhood of East Cobb failed with a wide margin of 73%, a wider margin than any other cityhood votes. And this result was truly indicative of our satisfaction with the representation of Commissioner Richardson. Concurrently, while circumventing the Cobb local delegation, he helped craft and evangelize a wildly over-engineered map fully intended to draw Commissioner Richardson out in the middle of her term, an unprecedented act that should have, <clears throat> that should have been seen as a current and present danger by every county commissioner here in the state of Georgia. And then there are the lawsuits. After the first one was withdrawn, Ed Setzer said that while he was not a part of the suit, he has interest in helping people get engaged with the lawsuit. And now there is a second lawsuit with a new second plaintiff that, yes, is a Cobb County citizen, but yes, also an elected Cobb County commissioner, and yes, resides in West Cobb. We, in East Cobb, are exhausted, exhausted by the West Cobb state senator's teenage level, 90s rom-com derived obsession with our side of the county and with our commissioner. One would have hoped that his new state senate colleagues would have told him to turn his focus on state's needs. We all knew that the unprecedented action from the state met by unprecedented resistance from the county would have to be adjudicated in the courts. But after Attorney General Carr's reluctance to engage here, despite Ed Setzer's many meetings with him on this topic, as confirmed by Ed Setzer himself at a Cobb GOP meeting, and after the state attorney's admittance that there's no real case law here, a statement he doubled down on in yesterday's state Senate committee, committee hearing for Senate Bill 124, and after bland, bland opinion letter after opinion letter from other agencies, there's now a barrage of spaghetti being thrown against the wall to see what sticks. I've always thought my career in sales was a full contact sports, and I've worked with Fortune 20 companies on seven, eight, nine figure deal transactions, and I've always assumed that politics was similar 
based on what I pay attention to in the news. But my God, <laughs> I really didn't know how much I underestimated this until I got engaged on the front lines here over the past year. And I've never seen someone so good have so much thrown at them at the same time. But there is good news, because there's now a quickly growing, galvanized, and energized community that is becoming fully engaged here, not just on this topic, by spreading, but spreading broadly across the spectrum of issues that are out here. As we heard today, there are real people in this county and state that have real problems. And we are ready to continue to do the work that is needed to improve everything and everyone around us. And I will end with this. If there are any politicians or would-be politicians in this room that are part of this SALT on COBS local control, please know that you will never, ever run for office again unopposed. Uh, thank you. And since I have 35 seconds, I do want to, I took some notes. By the way, you can own chickens here in Cobb County. That is, that is, I just want to help the gentleman out there. I have four, you can have so many per square foot on your property. Uh, the Constitution can be wrong. Consultants are expensive, but they're not evil, but they'd be too expensive for a county to purchase. And uh, DEI is good. I can't believe I'm saying that, 2023. Diversity is a good thing. So thank you very much. Craig Harfoot. Good evening. My name's Craig Harfoot. And um, oh, where to start? The court services. Um, I worked in DFAX 13 years. And, you know, what he's proposing is a good thing, but the overall theme was COVID caused more domestic violence. You know, they printed all this money and they caused more problems. But what I really wanted to talk about was drugs. And there, there's alcohol. And I mean, it, all that plays into domestic violence. But <clears throat> there was a, a meeting when Tim Lee was here and I came, and the whole audience, and it was standing room only, was from South Cobb, predominantly black, and they were all up in arms about chronic candy. And the whole point of that is they, they were really concerned for their children and drugs. And I, I've been concerned since my kids went through school in the Walton District. There's drugs in all our schools. And, um, and my comment to the people there that night was, are, are you starting the box of rebellion? And, and that's when it struck me. And it, it, it hit really hard at home today. And I'm doing these research. I go to high school. I, and I was in high school between 64 and, no, 65 and 68, four years. They had us. And when I went to that high school, up till about 67, there were only five kids that maybe smoked weed in 2000. And it was just some little hamburger joint across the street. And the Vietnam War's going on. You know, 67's when desegregation happened in our school. And um, that's not a contributing thing. I'm not trying to say that. but. Um, 68, still not. Get to junior college in 69, 70. And this is when Ken Kesey's doing the electric acid Kool-Aid test with the help of the CIA and uh, hallucinogenic drugs and all that stuff. But um, South Florida and development, it's about Disney World. I tried to send you all something about, you know, supposedly Ron DeSantis cracked down on Disney on some special exemptions they got. And basically the CIA was involved in acquiring the land for Disney World. But what they don't talk about is how the banks funded Disney World. And it's laundering drug money. South Florida, you, you get into the whole 
is one of those South Florida banks that <clears throat> started the conversation with about Noriega and the Panamanian drug connection. And it was uh, Lawton Childs and, you know, we invaded Panama. We, we took them out. But in development and banks in America, the biggest money launderers for drugs are the banks. And it's, it's like, what I care about most is our children, my grandchildren, your kids, everybody's kids. And, you know, with this court thing, it's like, how in the world are we ever going to get anywhere if our own federal government's involved in it at the highest levels? And I tried to talk to the county manager and says, oh, that's just people's choice. Well, it's, you, you're trying to do something about domestic violence. You can't just have that attitude. It just it won't work. And I, I hope, if anything, that would unify this whole community. I don't care what the census report you put on the little box about race. This is the one thing we all got in common. And it's the one thing that would fix our country. And it's really important because, you know, I got looking at all this stuff and this mobility sploss for 30 years. I wanted to say that is way wrong. And, and the whole thing is the way you do the sploss here, you're actually using taxpayer money to campaign for a tax. And you're doing it with these consultants right here. And the only thing I ever filed against Cobb County was state ethics and you're not allowed to Mr. Harford, sorry, for your, taxes your time's up. With tax Mr. Uh, Parker, your next public speaker. Good evening, William Parker, citizen of Cobb County, Chairwoman Cupid, commissioners. There's a lot to unpack about what's going on in here tonight, but I just want to tell a short story, if I may, particularly on this issue of uh, the transit issue and other things in Cobb County. I used to work for a company who I shan't name because uh, they've gone the way of the dodo bird, so it really doesn't matter. The general manager there used to have staff meetings about once a week or so, and at every staff meeting, his refrain was, we got to cut expenses. We got to cut expenses. We got to cut expenses. This kept going on for a period of time. And one day I stood up and told him, I said, You know, I, said, I have a suggestion for you. He said, What's that? I said, Why don't we just close the door, send everybody home, just shut the business down? You won't have any expenses and it'll be all over. Well, we can't do that. I said, Well, why are you complaining? I mean, it costs money to run a business, it costs money to run a government, it costs money to run a county. And I, for one, I'm probably one of the most senior people in this room. I'm getting a little bit sick and tired of old people talking about how to run this county 30, 40, 50 years from now. You're not going to be here anyway, so it doesn't matter what it's going to cost. It's just not your issue, okay? Take care of the, you, you have to invest in the business. You have to invest in the business of a for-profit company. You have to invest in, invest in the business of a government. It's not going to run by itself. It's not going to pay for itself. You have to spend money to make it work. I can see people might not want to spend money, and if you've had a pretty crummy life all your life, it's your fault. Everybody was born equal. We all came in here with nothing, and I guarantee you 100% actuarial tables, you tell me you ain't going to get out of here alive, and I've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse, so you ain't taking it with you either. Okay. And I don't think anybody else has seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. But let's stop talking about this stuff, about what we don't want to spend money on, and let's decide what we need to invest money in to make life better for the future gener generations of Cobb County and for the people who are here now. Partisan politics aside, it's just not going to make any difference. Several people have had some signs up tonight, and there have been a couple of comments about racism. I was a co-chair of a 
DNI committee of an organization that I, vol I don't volunteer with them. I'm a member. I pay dues, so it's not volunteering. Okay. And when the president of the organization first asked me to co-chair that committee, I said, I don't want to do that. He said, why not? I said, you know, I've been black my entire life. I understand racism perfectly. It's not my problem. It has never been a black problem. It has always been a white problem, and you people have to solve the problem. It's not us. It's not our problem. It was your problem right from 1619 until today, and it has not changed. It just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And it's not going to, and I can't stop you from being racist. Only you can do that. I can't change. The only thing I tell people all the time, the people I work with and otherwise, that the only thing on the planet that I can personally control is my thinking. That's all I can control, my thinking and my attitude. And I reserve the right to change my thinking anytime I want to. And if you want, to, if you want the population or the politics to stop being divisive, stop being divisive. You create the problem. The problem is a human-created problem. It's not a system problem. We are the system. People talk about follow the law. The law is whatever we say it is. People make the law, okay? The law is not something that's created or handed down. No, Moses is not bringing down the tablets from the mountain anymore. I'm not even sure he did it in the first place, but if he did, that's gone. Now we have new law. We make it. And for people who don't live in the area, trying to make rules for people who do, and whether that be in part of the county, a part of the state, a part of the nation, it doesn't make sense. Let the people decide. If the people want to pay taxes for 30 years for transit, put it out there and let them vote on it. People elected a county commissioner, and some guy came along and said, oh, I don't like your choice, so I'm going to negate your vote. And, cause, and then I don't know what he, what he had in mind other than that. But I don't accept it. I don't agree with it. I don't accept it. Thank you. Denny Wilson. Good evening. Uh, my name is Denny Wilson. I'm from District 4. I came here tonight to talk about an issue that I've got great problems with in my community, but um, <clears throat> I was sitting back and I heard somebody speak of, the, of a secret meeting uh, that had taken place. I don't think that it was a secret meeting because there were many stakeholders there. I think that was called together to discuss um, issues surrounding the entire county. There were people from South Cobb, West Cobb, and East Cobb. And I was one of the people at the table, and I really enjoyed being able to converse with people from other parts of the county, get their take on how they felt that things should go. So there was no, there was nothing negative about that meeting. So I'm just gonna set the record straight about that, okay. What I'm here tonight to talk about is this health facility that Cobb Douglas County Health wants to put on the Magnolia Crossing property. Now, all of a sudden, I pick up a newspaper article and I read gonorrhea, syphilis, and chlamydia is running rapid in the Six Flags area. I never heard that before until they decided they wanted to put a health center on Magnolia Crossing. Now, if that was the case in that community, why were we, the community, not notified? And furthermore, I'm not against a health facility coming to that area because I know I've heard people say that the one in the community center is very small. But what I am against is this is another plot from Doug Stoner to get his way in our community. So if he couldn't get the housing community, now he comes back with a public health facility to say, well, I did something. And what bothers me is this didn't happen until Joel Coates from Mick 
was put on the South Carolina Redevelopment Authority. All of a sudden, he gets appointed, and Doug Stoner gets his health center. So I'm, I'm very angry about that, because if the area was conducive for that, you're putting a health center in an area where crime is running rapid, prostitution is running rapid, you've done nothing to rehabilitate that area. And if you had rehabilitated the people in that area, before you come with the health center, then I can bless it. But I can't even go over there to get food without somebody reaching through my window with a bag of dope. I mean, so how do you think that senior citizens are gonna utilize that facility and feel safe? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna, you say you got a food desert, you say you got a, a banking desert, you getting ready to have a public health desert. Because I can tell you now, I would never go there. I mean, and I'm sure there's a lot of seniors in that area that feel the same way that I do. So before you start placing things in there like that, I think they should have come in, they should have uh, um, probably partnered with the police to eradicate some of that crime there. They should have talked to the community. They should have talked to the seniors. Nobody said anything. All of a sudden, I pick up the paper one day, and bam, there it is. We're getting a health facility at Six Flags. I mean, and, and nobody came out and talked to us. And people talk about secret meetings. See, uh, Chairwoman Cuba didn't have a secret meeting. The secret meeting took place with the city of Mableton. Thank you. Pamela Reardon. My name is Pamela Reardon, and I haven't been around for a while, but um, I think the last night meeting, um, last month, there was a certain person that had some professional help and diced and sliced and cut videos of some of us giving our um, comments. And I was at a meeting in South Cobb where I volunteer as uh, on the board of directors for Family Life uh, Restoration Center in Mableton, and I donate my time to help the community. And that's not the only one. And for this person, to paint me as a racist, I'm gonna set the record straight. I am not a racist. I have had all sorts of friends, all colors, all nationalities, and I still do. The issue that I spoke about before was the, the law in this state, the Constitution, home rule, does not cover the local municipalities to draw their own maps. And that is why in the legislature there has to be more bills so it's clarified. Now, I am living in East Cobb. This affects me and I have two commissioners, I guess, because in November, Joanne Burrell was elected and I voted for her because I'm in that district. So how do you reconcile this thinking that we conducted elections last year and we had voted for two people because they were in they were up in November and they, those districts are now different districts so we voted for them. So as of January 1st, Ms. Richardson needs to resign. So she's illegally sitting in that chair. Um, the other issue I want to talk about is the transportation. HB 930, that's what allows you to authorize a 30-year increase in our taxes, our sales taxes. And it is 30 years. And guess what, folks? It doesn't stay in Cobb County. It goes directly to MARTA. And I do not know for the life of me why every single time this is spoken about, it's never ever mentioned that it goes to MARTA. 
and then we have to have our project list, and then we have to beg them to get our money back to do the projects. And twice before, it was voted down in Gwinnett County. So Cobb County, I hope, will do the same thing. If anyone has any comments for me, um, I can stay later. We can discuss these issues. But this, that's how it is. And thank you very much. Thank you. Ginny Coat. Thank you, Pam. Um, my husband's 86, so he is the oldest one in the room, I think. Ma'am, if you could please state your name. My name is Virginia Choate. Uh, I'm here to talk about the tax tra uh, transit tax proposal. Spending 530000 on consultants whose advice will help promote, plan, and implement a 30-year, one-cent transit sales tax even before we taxpayers even approve this project is imprudent and irresponsible. The 30-year, one-cent transit sales tax proposal, I had hoped, wouldn't be approved anyway. I believe as it wasn't supported by the general population, Cobb mayors, and two commissioners in 2022. It was wisely dropped for voter consideration back then. Near future transit technology will likely make it in more buses or high-speed rail, et cetera, much less viable, if not obsolete, within this taxable 30-year period. Additional bus or MARTA-like transit proposals don't solve our home to destination and back needs, even now in a suburban environment that we currently have and want to maintain. Is urbanization of Cobb into high-density housing centers the ultimate goal here? Otherwise, it makes no sense to me. We already know that business office occupancy has declined tremendously. Remotely working from home is the growing preference. Zoom business meeting technology is fast replacing the face-to-face -face communication requirement. All will continue to, cha to change the transit environment in ways that can't be predicted or defined over such a 30-year tax period. A five-year, one-cent tax dedicated to infrastructure building, such as reversible lanes, traffic circles, kinetic traffic, signal co coordination, et cetera, makes more sense. These types of solutions actually work on our secondary and tertiary roads. That's where the real traffic problems exist for most of us. You don't need to hire consultants to accomplish this either. Our economic outlook includes a likely recession, according to our financial experts at the state and federal levels. Even if Cobb County continues to thrive, the inflation effect on family budgets has been severe and is rising again, according to the CPI. An additional one cent or two cent sales tax will really hurt our lower and middle class on items needed to feed, house, and clothe families. Safety, health care, and children's education issues should be our commissioner's priorities. I urge you to confine your ambitions to those three as they are fundamental to our existence. Thank you. Chairwoman, that was the last public speaker. Thank you, Bill. Okay, we are at our appointments tab, and the first appointment is um, by Commissioner Gambrell. Thank you, and Jason Shepard, I believe you are in the audience, yes? If you want to stand up, Jason. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to approve the appointment of Jason Shepard to the Development Authority of Cobb County. Second. All right, is there any discussion? Call the question. The motion carries 5-0. Our next appointment is also by Commissioner Gambrell. And this is to announce the reappointment of Forrest Sheely to the Transit System Advisory Board. Thank you. And the next item is by Commissioner Burrell. 
Yes, I would like to approve the appointment of Jerry Cooper to the Board of Tax Assessors. He will be replacing um, Jack Demarest, who retired at uh, the end of last year and served on this board. Jack served on this board for over 20 years. So thank you, Jack, for your service and welcome, Mr. Cooper. Thank you. Was that a motion? Mm hmm. Motion to approve. All right. A second. Is there any discussion? Call the question. The motion carries 5 0. And we have item 37. Go right ahead. And Sherry was here tonight. Um, I would like to <laughs> announce the announce the reappointment of Sherry Newton to the Transit System Advisory Board. Thank you, Commissioner. That concludes our appointments for this evening, and we are at the Commissioner's Public Address. Go right ahead, Commissioner. Ten slots are still open for the day trip to Gibbs Gardens. You can pick up location will be at the West Cobb Senior Center on Thursday, May 11th. And you need to arrive before 8 a.m. to get good seats. Uh, for more information, you can see the West Cobb Senior Center. This, weather, this week, weather permitting, our Cobb Library Bookmobile will be visiting on Saturday, March 4th at the Kennesaw Touch-A-Truck at Adams Park. This event will be from 10 to 2 p.m. at 2600 Park Drive, Kennesaw, Georgia. Book checkouts will be available for all ages. Our North Cobb Library is proud to present a preview performance of The Seedling, written and presented by Kennesaw State University theater students. Pre-show activities will start at 10.30 a.m. on Friday, March 3rd. No reservations are required and all ages are welcome. North Cobb Regional Library is located at 3535 Old Highway 41 Northwest in Kennesaw. And our good friend Mike Gold was named the GIAA District 1 Girls Basketball Coach of the Year. Both the boys and girls teams from Dominion Christian um, High School won the region championships. It was a special night. Both Mike and Coach Schmidt won Regional Coach of the Year as well. It was a special moment as Coach Gold got to cut down the net, which is custom when you win the championship. And there was no way that he could climb the ladder, but coaches, parents, and the security, and our police department and friends all helped him climb the ladder and helped him cut down the net. Congratulations, Dominion Christian High School. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Richardson. All right, so from the office, thank you for joining the priorities tour. Today was the last day. However, I did speak with a couple of groups and said we'll make some special allowances for uh, additional meetings to go as well. Um, but had, I think the most tour stops in one day was right at around seven. So just really appreciate the engagement from the community in sharing with me what's important to you so that we can uh, pull, all, pull all that together and then represent that as our community priorities and moving forward. Next, um, had the opportunity to speak. Uh, last Wednesday, I was invited to the Council for Quality Growth's monthly luncheon. Had the opportunity and uh, share, to share all the amazing things going on in Cobb and of course the different priority uh, categories that we have going on in District 2. So thank you again for that opportunity. Also, Smyrna's Black History Month dinner. Um, had got, got a chance to join uh, with Commissioner Gambrell as well. Um, and Commissioner Sheffield, we had a chance to um, engage with an author here. Um, this was last Friday. It was a great way to finish out Black History Month. The featured guest of the evening was Erica Armstrong Dunbar, a historian, author, and HBO show producer. Um, she spoke about her findings on the life of Harriet Tubman, who was actually born with the name Ar <laughs> Araminta Ross. It was a great event full of joy, education, and bonding. In the community, 
Reading launch pads have landed at Cobb Libraries. Playaway Launchpad Reading Academy tablets are now available for checkout. This five-level guided reading system helps kids master verbal, reading, and writing skills starting at any level. Every app, storybook, and video has been hand-selected to help kids gain the knowledge they need to transition from learning to read to reading to learn. Find more information on the website at cobcat.org slash early learning. This project was assisted through a grant from the Georgia Public Library Service with federal pandemic funding from the governor's office. And lastly, community emergency response team training. Applications for Cobb County community emergency response team initial training are due by noon March 8th to participate in the new class. The program trains people to be better prepared to respond to emergency situations within their communities. When emergencies happen, CERT members can give critical support to first responders, provide immediate assistance to vic victims, and organize spontaneous volunteers at a disaster site. CERT members can also help with non-emergency projects that help improve the safety of our community. Limited seats are available. Selected volunteers will meet 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. each Saturday, March 11th, 18th, um, 18th and 25th at the Cobb County Emergency Operations Center in Marietta. And hopefully you had a chance to capture the QR code. Thank you. Concludes my comments. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner Burrow. Thank you. Well, as we kick off March 1st, tomorrow, you can start your morning out at 8.30 a.m. with coffee with your cop. Come out and meet Precinct 4 and Officer Justice, our Community Affairs Unit um, Officer, at the Starbucks at 1207 Johnson Ferry Road in Marietta tomorrow morning at 8.30. Um, we also have a community open house on March 7th at Bells Ferry Elementary School, 2600 Bells Ferry Road, uh, to go over the and get community input on the Noonday Creek Trail Extension Study. Join Cobb County DOT and me for a drop-in community <coughs> open house to learn more about the Noonday Creek Trail Extension Study project background and existing conditions within the study area. You will also have an opportunity to review and provide feedback on potential trail options that may be considered, as well as potential trail amenities and features at the meeting. It's from 5.30 to 7.30, Tuesday, March 7th at Bells Ferry Elementary. Um, also, on March 16th from 6 to 8 at Piedmont Church, we will be hosting the 2022 Splos Shaw Park Project Community Meeting. Join Cobb Parks and me for a community, community meeting 6 to 8 p.m. Thursday, March 16th at Piedmont Church, 570 Piedmont Road. This is an opportunity to discuss and gather input related to renovating Shaw Park with 2022 Splos funds. Um, if you want more information, the website is th down there at the bottom, um, or you can email jordan.wood at cobbcounty.org. The Town Center CID is hosting their second annual Noonday Shanty 510K race on March 25th. The Noonday Shanty 5K 510K is a fun run coming back to Cobb this spring. Run along the Noonday Creek Trail while supporting future green space and trail projects in the town center area. The race is an, is, is an official qualifying event for the Peachtree Road Race. We expect to see you there, Ms. Madam Chair, <laughs> <laughs> in preparation for the Peachtree. Uh, you can register online at towncentercid.com <coughs> slash alliance slash noonday dash shanty. And there are flyers in the back table in the lobby for, um, with more information on this. And last but not least, we've lost a great man in Major Stanley Bell. He retired last Friday 
and I was fortunate to crash his party. <laughs> you had that black on there, like it was a worse situation than, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> um, Ooh, honey. I'm blue sorry. Next time. Blue. I'm sorry, gosh. <laughs> I didn't mean like that. Any, anyway, after 24 years of service, um, Major Bell is retiring and he will be greatly missed. He's made an impact in the various units that he's been a part of in his 24 years of service. We greatly appreciate his service to the citizens of Cobb and all that he has done for officers that he has impacted and citizens. And always with a smile and a pleasant attitude. We wish you all the best in your retirement. That's all I have. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Burrow. I'm sorry. It's okay. Thank you. I hear he's coming back as a um, retired officer. Good. So maybe we'll see him. Maybe he'll be in our meetings. <laughs> all right, Commissioner. District 4 news and updates. Early voting for mayoral and city council races for the city of Mableton are underway now until March Hold 7th. Hold on one second. I'm hearing some interference. Oh, okay. I think he's walking out. Go ahead, Commissioner. Are underway now until March 17th. Voting locations are at the Mabel House Arts Center located at 5239 Floyd Road and at the South Cobb Community Center located at 620 Lion Clubs Drive. Uh, election day is on March 21st, and at that point you will vote at your regular polling location. For polling location and times, please visit cobbcounty.org. Life's Not All Black and White got to Add Color exhibit featuring over 30 quilts by award-winning local quilter Jan Cunningham is being presented by the East Cobb Quilters Guild in collaboration with Cobb County and Cobb County Parks. The show will be held at the Mabel House Arts Center located at 5239 Floyd Road beginning on Thursday, March 2nd and running through Thursday, March 30th. The gallery is open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. There will be a reception in honor of Ms. Cunningham and a chance to meet her personally on Saturday, March 4th from 2 to 4 p.m. For more information, contact Barkley Russell at 770-235-3613 or email Barkley, that's B-A-R-K-L-E-Y, at BarkleyRussellAgency.com. Turner Chapel AME Church invites you to learn how to build generational wealth during their Financial Empowerment Conference series on March 3rd and 4th at 492 North Marietta Parkway in Marietta. Chelsea McNeil, 11 Alive Meteorologist, will host Friday's Financial Fun Night, an evening filled with food, fun, and games. Saturday's Education Day activities will include breakfast and a panel discussion. You may register for this free conference at turnerchapelame.org. After decades in the making, the community meetings and feedback, we are ready to reveal the building design for the Osborne Recreation and Community Center. Please join me, the community center designers, and our parks director on Thursday, March 9th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. at the Windy Hill Community Center located at 1885 Roswell Street in Smyrna. A special thanks to the residents that attended our town halls last year to provide feedback on design concepts. Your, your input was invaluable. Cobworks unveiled the design of the new Cobworks, Cobworks Workforce Development Center on February 15th. The new center will be located on Mableton Parkway and will be a preeminent resource for education, training, and employment for residents and employers in South Cobb. Housed with a fully resourced computer lab, large meeting rooms, co-working spaces, and offices for small business and entrepreneurs, the new Workforce Development Center will act as a catalyst for economic development and alleviate poverty by improving employment and education outcomes for residents and build talent pipelines for employers. The center is scheduled to open this fall. 
Please join me for an upcoming town hall meeting to share District 4 updates. There are a lot of great updates to share, including 2022 accomplishments and goals for 2023. I will also share City of Mableton updates. The meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, March 14th from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. at the Cobb County Public Safety Police Academy located at 2435 East West Connector in Austell. And finally, mark your calendar for the Mableton Improvement Coalition's annual Taste of Mableton. Last year's inaugural event was a huge success. The community came together as one to enjoy multicultural food, lots of fun, great music, community fellowship, and discussion panels to include elected officials. The event is scheduled for April 15th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. at the Mabel House Complex located at 5239 Floyd Road in Mableton. Join us for a day of family fun, prizes, and much more. Please visit Mableton.org for additional information and vendor opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I always enjoy how we end our meetings because we get to hear of the commissioner's service in the county, which truly reflects the spirit, I think, that drove all of us to desire to serve. Sometimes I wish our meetings not only ended this way, but were this way, where we saw that reflected. And, and maybe because this work is difficult, we sometimes see the challenges of our meeting. But I must say, over the last 10 years that I've served, I am seeing a degradation of the general level of respect and decorum that I've seen prior. And I just had to share that tonight because when I saw those Boy Scouts here, I saw my children observing behavior that I wish that they would never observe of adults. And people may fight to have that level of disrespect and, and um, discord but it certainly shows the sign of the times that we're in, that that's what we're advocating for, instead of finding out how we can best come together as a county. And so while I'm here happy to hear my commissioners, I'm a little frustrated by what we continue to observe in public comment. With being the chair, I have responsibility of leading the decorum of this audience and I'm sharing my heart that I wonder if I'm doing you, if I'm doing you a disservice, um, because my ascension to this role um, took me having to bear a lot, and I think I bear a lot because I've learned to push through, and I've gotten a lot through it, um, through humility and enduring, and I'm still pushing towards the mark. Um, I've learned that you could overcome challenges and still do some great things. And so when I see the level of disrespect here, I just don't have it in me to go back and forth with that. And there was once upon a time where that was who I was, to go back and forth with people, but that's not who I am today, nor I think what this county needs as a leader. but uh, I'm, I'm reflecting upon what our meetings have become. This is not who we should be as a county. What we should be is a county that serves and desires for everyone to become their best selves and for every community to be great here within this county. I think that's what the struggle for DE and I is because I can tell you when I moved from East Cobb and lived in West Cobb and moved to South Cobb, Cobb County was not treating all areas of this county equally. It was not. And you can see the impact of that today. When you look at different communities, not just geographically, but demographically, not everyone's experience has been here. So it's so frustrating to hear the, the animus towards people who use words or verbs to show that they want an inclusive community to now be impugned for wanting to be exclusive of others. When I know from my experience here, we have come a long way of becoming more inclusive of how we serve and treat others with the desire for being welcoming. So as I sit here and I grapple with this as a leader up here on this dais, 
Um, I think we all need to be grappling with this. I think we all need to be grappling with who we are and what we want to be as a county. Because what, from what I saw today, I think we are so much more and should be. That's my challenge. Thank you and have a good evening.